with more hardware. So we mentioned that there's more hardware uh, besides CPU and GPUs. So for example, here's the Qualcomm Snapdragon um, 845. So this is the chip you maybe find on your Android phones. So you can look at the chip. You have multiple com components there. So on the top right, this is a GPU. And close to the right button, this is a CPU. Between the GPU and the CPU, there's something called ISP, which is called image signal processing. On the left hand of the ISP is something called DSP. This is a digital signal processing. You can see that both DSP and ISP take a lot of area from the chip. Um, actually, it's pretty powerful, and we can use for deep learning. For example, the DSP, called the Digital Signal Processor, which is designed for digital process algorithms. For example, we can do very efficient matrix dot convolutions, FFTs. The first two are pretty related to deep learning here. And the design purpose of the DSP is that sometimes it's much higher accuracy uh, performance, usually maybe five times more powerful than GPUs, mobile GPUs. And the biggest advantage is that it uses less power, which means if you run something on your mobile phones, you don't want to get mobile so hot. So you want to save the power, which means if you run deep learning algorithms on DSPs instead of GPUs and CPUs, and you can run more, much more on the battery mode. A little bit of thing about the architecture. Um, the architecture is called very long instruction words. On the CPU, for each instruction, you maybe can compute like tens of uh, floating multiplications. But on DSPs, for each instruction, you can compute hundreds of floating multiplications here. So that's a key thing, actually you have even low frequency compute CPU, but DSPs may be much 10, 10 times stronger than CPU. But that's the advantage. The disadvantage is that, well, DSP is a little bit hard to program, is to program and debug. Especially the compiler tool chain, actually the quality uh, varies from chip vendors. That's a uh, uh, disadvantage. Okay, so the advantage is that DSP is usually faster than GPUs and more power efficient. And the disadvantage is that DSP is pretty hard to program if you are not familiar with all the DSPs, how to debug and how to program so hard. And also, like, depending on the ch chip vendors, the, um, the tool chain quality varies. Another one is called FPGA. You may heard about that before. Like, it's pretty different to DSP and normal program we have. So FPGA have a large number of programmable logic blocks and we can reconfigure these different interactions between these uh, blocks. So you normally, on CPU and the GPU, we run the program and execute on that. But the FPGAs, what they do is like, you run the program to describe what the hardware looks like. During the compilation, you actually change the FPGA so that it can enum enumerate the hardware you can have. So each compilation here, it maybe take a few hours or even a few days. Then once you compile it, then you get a new hardware, you can run your programs there. So you can use a common language called the VHDL or Verilog to do that thing. You, you need to learn a lot of things for that. Um, the, the one that you hear, sometimes FPGA can provide high efficiency than general purpose hardware. Because you can configure hardware only designed for your application. You can remove all these other things you don't need. So you can have higher efficiency, but again, it's not so commonly used. The tool chain, also the quality varies. So sometimes you get very good compilers, you can compile very fast. Sometimes it's pretty slow. And also compilation takes so many hours. It's so hard to debug. The other one is called AIASIC or AI chip. You, you may have heard about that before. Like it's pretty hot topic on deep learning. So every major company uh, companies uh, like uh, Intel, Qualcomm, that's chip vendors, or like IT companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, are building their own AI chips. Among them, Google TPU is, the, is kind of the earliest one, and it's the most success, successful one. 
So Google TPU can match high-end NVIDIA GPU's uh, performance, which means they can provide 100 teflops uh, floating point. But the, the one that you hear, if you buy a high-end NVIDIA GPUs, it takes you maybe $10,000. But if you want to produce a TPU by yourself, it takes you may, maybe $500. That's 20 times difference. So that's a major, that's a major benefit. So at Google, TPUs are widely deployed, and um, people can research kind of using TPUs. And actually, most of Google researchers, you, if you read the paper, a lot of researchers are based on TPU instead of GPUs. The core of the TPU is called systolic array. So we're going to have a very brief introduction of what is systolic array and show that why TPU is good for deep learning. The systolic array is kind of, you have an array of processing elements, it's called PE. Every PE you can think of, is, you can think you can do two, given two floating points, you can do multiplication. That's a, it's a simplified version. Then the systolic array, which is we align these PEs into a 2D mesh and connect by rows and by columns. And besides, we have input buffer and output buffer. So you can see that's pretty simple. You can configure the number of rows, number of columns, you can configure the input and output buffer size. Then this one is designed for matrix matrix multiplication. So let, let us show example here. We're going to compute y equals to w times, ed, uh, times x. w is 3 by 3 matrix. x is 3 by 2 matrix. So y, again, we know y is 3 by 2. So what are we going to do here? Before we compute, we put each element of w into a single PE. So we align w here. We also kind of align x by a, by a particular shape in the input buffer. So that is the data pre uh, pair, uh, pairing stage. At time one, what we do is like we move the input buffer to left by one step. So you can see that x1, x11 is now on the left of top, top PE. So given the input, the PE does multiplications between the weight W11 and the input x11. Because the other two rows are just the zeros, nothing happened. Now time two. Time two, we do two things. Firstly, we further move the input to left by another step. So you can see that x11 is now at the second column. And the first column is x12, and the second row is x21. X2, so we move the input to another to left by another step. The, first, the second thing we are doing here, we move the result from the PE to the bottom. So you can see that x11 times w11, this is the, the top left PE results we have in the previous time. Now we move to the bottom. OK, so two things, one to left, one to bottom. Input to left, result to bottom. Time two, similar thing. We further move input to, not to left again. So x11 is now at the third column. And the, the result, x11 times w11, we get on the time one, is now on the third row. Similarly, we also move other results uh, to left and to bottom as well. We continue to do that. Now we have the left bottom PE output these results. It's actually equal to 1, 1, a y11. Okay, so if we do that again, we get the another result y12, uh, y21, and again, again, now at, at time 7, we actually get all this result of y. So here is an example how we first put the weight into PEs, and given, given different input, we can compute y. So that is how systolic array works. So saying, so assume that usually on deep learning, the W is the weight matrix, or the convolution kernel we're going to introduce the next week. Then we put different x, and we can compute. Usually, the x, the number of rows of x, uh, uh, is kind of the number of examples you have is could, could be very long. Then the efficiency of the statistical array is pretty high usually. In general, if we want to do general size matrix multiplications, depends on the, the array size. We just uh, 
padding zeros or and slice matrix into the fixed size and put the data into a sysl array accordingly. And we can, because now we see that three by three matrix, we have latency equals to seven, which means if we have a lot of inputs and we can batch in, then we can reduce the latency. So this solid array actually have very good throughput. Now this is only for matrix matrix multiplications. Uh, if you want to do other things like sigmoid, um, you want to have dedicated chips to do that as well. Question. Is there also benefits for using sparse algebra? Uh, not too much, unfortunately. Um, if you do sparse, um, so there's a bunch of uh, AI sick to sparse things. For sparse, usually people don't care about performance too much. They care about power. If I know this input is zero, I can skip, I, I don't want to fetch the data, I can skip the computation, which is saves a lot of power. Currently, we don't have, the hardware don't have these functionalities, and sparse, chi sparse computational chips usually almost a similar performance as dense ones, but it can reduce maybe by 10 times on power, which is pretty popular for like edge devices. Okay, other question, other questions? Okay, so it's a very brief introduction of all the hardware you have. So we can classify that into like the X axis is the performance and the power efficiency. To the, 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 to the left we have most of the power and to the right we have, uh, to the left we have uh, the uh, <laughs> slow one. And the Y axis is the flexibility, how to easy to program, how to debug and how to deploy. We can see that CPU is the easiest one to use. So no matter it's Intel CPUs, MD CPUs, ARM CPUs, almost like we can write the same program and using the same compiler to compile on that. Every program runs similarly on CPUs. GPU is faster than CPU, but it will be harder to program. You need to learn CUDA for NVIDIA GPUs, and for AMD and Intel GPUs, much harder is you need to use OpenCL. Then DSPs, DSP is usually only for mobile phones, for small devices, for ACO, for example, smart uh, uh, homes. DSP kinds of higher efficiency than mobile GPUs, but still like lower than the NVIDIA desktop GPUs. But again, it's even harder to program. FPGAs, you need to know exactly what ar system architecture we have. Uh, you need to know about hardware too, a lot. ASIC, ASIC kind of, we put here, it's still on the early stage. It's dedicated to run put up some, some algorithms, not all of them, and you need to, know, something's wrong, then you need to really know what happened there. But again, we think maybe in the last, in the coming one, two year, there's a lot of ASIC coming, come in. No matter it's on the cloud, no matter it's on the mobile phones, we cannot see a lot of ASIC come in in the next one, two year. So if you're going to do research uh, on deep learning uh, system architecture or any um, mm, radio field you maybe consider to do, understand ASIC. If you want to do, like, goes to industrial to deploy different models into hardware, you may be considering, yes, DSPs, FPGA probably not, and also ASIC as well. Okay.